Welcome back to the Mac Tech Tech. Today we have a special treat. We're going to feature a custom build around Aminatu Veil Piercer from the new Duskmorn set. They are one of the face commanders for the precons. Um, obviously those decks haven't been spoiled yet, at least not for me. So we're going to go ahead and do a custom build for them. We're also going to go ahead and specialize into the room mechanic from Duskmorn. I think the room mechanic is super interesting. They're basically fuse cards, but like they're on enchantments instead of instants and sorceries, which is generally how they're played. And uh, there's also an alternate win con among the rooms for just having a couple rooms unlocked. And I think it's a pretty realistic goal for us. So what is our game plan? Well, step one, manipulate the top of our deck, right? We want to control what the very top card is at the very least. Step two. We're going to ensure that we're drawing cards not only on our own turn for that miracle, but also on our opponent's turn. And step three is more room support. Uh, we're also going to go over each of the rooms that have been revealed so far. Um, but overall, we're really just here for... Um, playing the rooms, unlocking them, and winning through that alt win con, and I think it's very plausible to do so. So starting with manipulating the top of our deck. Well, Aminatu Veil Piercer does that herself. She allows us to surveil two at upkeep. So if it's not one of the cards that are manipulating the top of our deck or drawing us cards on our opponent's turn, or a room itself, or just like a really expensive enchantment that we would love to see a miracle cost for, we're happy to throw it in the grave. Being in black does give us access to some graveyard recursion. We're not really running it in this deck, uh, but you definitely could. Following up on Inatu, we have the Moon Blessed Cleric. So Moon Blessed Cleric is a 3 cost, 3-2 three, when they enter the battlefield. You get to go ahead and just grab any enchantment you want and slam it on top. They're great for this deck. You know, we have a lot of enchantments in the deck. I think we're sitting around 22. And the ability to tutor any of them to the top of the deck, knowing that when we draw it with Aminatu out, we're going to get that cost reduction of 4, is phenomenal. Thalsa, God of the Sea, is more in line with the Aminatu strat, right, of... This one's going to scry instead of surveil. Uh, but both are good, right? If it's not the card we want, we're just going to move it out of the way. Ponder is up next. It is Sorcery Speed. But we are going to look at the top three, arrange them in any order we want, and then draw a card. So, ideally, you have a non-enchantment be the very top card at the end of this. And then two enchantments below that. That way, when we draw cards on our opponent's turns, we're going to get those miracle costs for ourselves. Brainstorm is honestly very similar. Uh, it does require that we've already done a little bit of setup to ensure that the first card we draw off that top is going to be a miracle. But we do get to stack the top two cards of our deck, setting up future miracles for ourselves, even if we didn't get it from, you know, just that one. Enlightened Tutor. So basically the Moon Bless Cleric all over again, a little cheaper, and an instant speed, so it is much better. It's also much more expensive. Uh, but for one, you know, generic, not generic mana, white mana, we know what cards cost here. For one white mana, we get to look for an artifact or enchantment. In this case, almost always enchantment. We do have some artifacts that we care about that we could put on top, but if we have Aminatu out, I think that going for one of the rooms or one of the things that are going to want us draw extra cards is really the way to go here. Following that up, we have Scroll Rack. So Scroll Rack is an excellent artifact. It's two mana to play, one in a tap to activate. We're basically going to swap our hand for an equal number of cards off the top of the deck. Now, this doesn't count as drawing these cards. Uh, they're just being put into our hand. And then the cards that we had in hand, we get to order them on top of the deck. So an excellent way to kind of set up multiple miracles in a row. In a similar, you know, sort of feel to it, we have Sensei's Divining Top. One to play, one to activate, no tapping required for this first ability, where we basically just rearrange the top three cards of our library. 
And it also acts as a card draw for us. So we could tap it down to draw a card and then put the Sensei's Divining Top on top of our deck. So now that we've manipulated the top of our deck pretty consistently, let's go ahead and draw some cards on our opponent's turn. Starting off, we're going to run some Trouble in Pairs. So Trouble in Pairs is a four cost enchantment. It ensures that none of our opponents are going to take extra turns. We love that. Whenever they attack us with two creatures, draw their second card, cast their second spell, we're going to draw a card. Uh, this is a ton of card draw built in, and I think Trouble in Pairs is going to really let us, one, keep our hand full, and two, you know, hit a bunch of miracles on our opponent's turns. Following that up, we have Search the Premises. So Search the Premises doesn't directly draw us cards, but it does generate us clues, which we could then crack to draw cards, you know, should our opponents decide that they wanted to attack us. So I think there's still value there. And with some of the cards in this deck being a little on the pricier side, like, you know, $20 and up, some budget cards are a little required for my building specifications. But, you know, teach their own. Speaking of those expensive cards, we're running Rhystic Study. We're going to tax our opponent's spells. If they don't pay, we're going to draw and, ideally, get a Miracle. In a super similar, but a little more budget sort of frame, we're also running Mystic Remora. So, one to play, cumulative upkeep of one, but the tax is super high. Uh, so it's any non-creature spells, so also a little more limited in terms of what it's going to hit for. Uh, but that tax of four is basically never getting paid. Moving up into our artifacts, we have Wedding Ring. So Wedding Ring is going to come in, it's going to create a copy of itself for one of our opponents. Whenever they draw a card, we're going to draw a card. It also affects life gain and whatnot. Um, but basically, we know our opponents are guaranteed to draw at least one card a turn, and we're here for it. There is no better card draw, it seems, than the One Ring. Uh, so the One Ring is going to come in for four mana, give us protection from everything, which is great. And, you know, let us just go ahead and gain a bunch of extra cards over the course of our opponent's turns. Granted, it is going to cost us a little bit of life, but I think we'll do okay. We're also running the Polywog Prodigy from Bloomborough. For two mana, we get a 1-3 with Evolve. Whenever an opponent casts a non-creature spell, if the mana value is less than Polywog Prodigy's power, we're going to draw cards. Uh, so this is actually going to hit quite a bit for any kind of like cantrips, mana rocks. I think we're going to be able to get them up to like two or three power pretty easy in this deck. We're also running James Wandering Dad slash Follow Him. So the Follow Him is going to let us investigate X times. And the ability to tap him down for two generic mana. Um, granted, we could only use it for activated abilities, but I do believe the rooms, once they're out on the field, to open one up is considered to be an activated ability. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, though. We're also playing the Esper Sentinel, a 1-1 one, one for 1 whenever an opponent casts their first non-creature spell. They are taxed based on Esper Sentinel's power. We're really not buffing them in this deck, um, but that one tax will still get paid at least probably early game, late game they might have the excess mana, but I think we're still going to get some value out of it. Let's go over that room support. Now again, the the entire set's not been spoiled, you know, it's not been released yet. There could be more room support, at which point I would probably add it into this deck. But at the time of recording, we basically only have one card that supports the rooms that I was able to find in these colors, and that's Ghostly Keybearer. So a 3-3 three, three for 4 with flying. When it deals combat damage to an opponent, we do get to unlock one of our rooms. So that's going to save us a ton of mana. I think it's a super strong effect. And I would also argue that it works really well with Nico Light of Hope, also from Duskmorn. So Nico is a 3-4 four for 4. Whenever he enters, you get to create two shard tokens. You can pay two and tap him to exile a creature that's non-legendary. The shards become copies of that creature. So it's like, cool, my ghostly key bear punched someone... You know, I played Nico. the next turn I exile my Ghostly Key Bear. Now I have two Key Bears. They each hit a player 
we unlock two rooms in one turn from that effect. I think it's pretty strong. Let's go over some of these rooms, though. We'll start off with Bottomless Pool slash Locker Room. So, Bottomless Pool is one blue mana. Whenever you unlock this door, you get to return up to one creature to its owner's hand. Little bounce spell. I think that's fine. It's not the strongest effect in the world, but, like, it can be relevant. Locker Room, a little more pricey, but perfect for that miracle. So it's four generic and a blue, so if we miracle it off, it's a single blue. Whenever one or more creatures we control deal combat damage to a player, we're going to draw a card. So if you have this active and you're doing the deck manipulation, you want to make sure that like you're doing so you're you're keeping track of when you're gonna draw cards to really ensure you're getting the miracle, you're not accidentally drawing it too early. Uh, but the rooms are all important. We want to run as many of them as possible in this deck. Moving on, we have Central Elevator slash Promising Stairs. Uh, Promising Stairs is honestly kind of what the whole deck is built around. We have a couple different ways of tutoring it up um, between our various um, just direct Enchantment Tutors, we have Xur the Enchanter, we have the Moonblast Cleric, uh, we have Idyllic and Enlightened Tutor. You know, I think we have a lot of ways of specifically cheating this up into our hand and onto the field, as well as just the abundance of card draw we have in this deck, right? We should never be without answers. Uh, but at the beginning of your upkeep, apologize, rambling, you're going to surveil one. You then win the game if there are eight or more different rooms that are unlocked under your control. Doors, rather. The room is the entire card. The door is half a card. So you could have as few as four of these room enchantments out. And assuming all of their doors are unlocked, you just win. And I think it's very doable. The other half is the Central Elevator. So Central Elevator is 4 mana, 3 generic, and a blue. Uh, whenever you unlock this, you get to search for another room that you don't already control. Put it in the hand. So you grab the other room. Ideally, you play it. Maybe you do some, you know, top of deck manipulation to put it back on top so that you could draw it and miracle it out. And you're already, like, halfway there. It's super strong. Let's keep this uh, this room train going, though, with the Dollmaker's Shop. So Dollmaker's Shop is one in a white. Whenever one or more non-toy creatures you control attack a player, you're going to create a 1-1 one -one toy artifact creature token. Uh, so these toy tokens are mainly here for chump blocking, uh, just to ensure that you're not getting blown out. Uh, we do have some other, like, tax on attacks. Try saying that ten times fast. Um, but, you know, if people see what we're doing, they're going to definitely want to try and, like, get rid of us. So, a little bit of, um, a little bit of a shield here can go a long way. Porcelain Gallery. So, Porcelain Gallery... A little more expensive, but again, that four generic mana with the two white means that this is perfect for a miracle. So just two white, ideally. Creatures you control have base power and toughness equal to the number of creatures you control. That takes these dolls that we've made and makes them huge. Right? Oh, I attacked with three creatures. They were already three threes, because it's I we're gonna argue all the creatures we had. We generate three more dolls on attack, and now those three three threes are actually three six sixes. Next, we have Funeral Room and Awakening Hall. So Funeral Room is two and a black. Whenever a creature we control dies, we're going to drain each opponent for one life. Awakening Hall, again, really looking for that miracle to reduce its cost. It's normally six generic, two black, but with the miracle, we could have it as cheap as two generic, two black. Whenever we unlock this door, we return all creatures from our grave to the battlefield. 
Her creature count in this deck is lower than most decks that I build. Uh, what are we sitting at? Let's take a look real quick. It's only 14 plus our commander, so like 15. Uh, but I still think that, you know, the creatures we do have matter. Uh, the ability to basically, I pay the, I pay the full cost for this, right? Eight mana, return all of our creatures that just died from a board wipe, probably get some cool ETB triggers off of them. I think it's still good value. Two rooms are left, and the next one up is Mirror Room slash Fractured Realm. Mirror Room is two and a blue. Whenever you unlock this door, you get to create a token that's a copy of another creature you control, except it's a reflection in addition to its other types. Last up is one that I think was just spoiled today as of recording, and that's Unholy Lobby slash Ritual Chamber. So Unholy Lobby is two and a black, at the beginning of your end step, you're going to draw a card if you control a demon. Each opponent will lose two life and you'll gain two life. Otherwise, you just lose two life. Definitely want to open that side second, because the Ritual Chamber for three and two black creates you a 6-6 six, six black demon creature token with flying. Uh, so you could miracle that out for two generic, or not two generic, again, two black mana, and then easily pay the other three mana, I think, and go ahead and start drawing cards at end step, and also draining opponents. But guys, that is the custom build. There's obviously a ton of other cards in the deck if you want to see a full deck list as it currently stands, and I'll be updating it as the set comes out uh, with any additional room support, any additional rooms, things of that nature. Uh, there's a link in the description, always. It goes to my Moxfield deck list. I have, I think, like 140-something decks over there built. Uh, that includes all of the pre-con upgrade guides from the past, as well as any decks that I've built for myself. Uh, but I'm Mechanized Minion. I'm the Energy King. If you felt like there were cards that I'm missing from here that you know, fell into those spots, definitely let me know. I'd like to make this deck for real and see how powerful these rooms could be. But until next time, good luck with your builds.